morning, all. Thank you for joining us again this morning. Um, hope you enjoyed your first seven chapters of the book of John. We're going to go ahead and open in prayer, and then we'll walk through our study time, uh, looking at some excerpts and having an open mic session. We're going to flip the order, but I'll tell you about that after we pray. Lord God, thank you for waking us up this morning, for giving us the breath of life, for giving us eternal life for those who know your son personally. Uh, as he clearly stated within this week's readings, um, I pray that we exposed ourselves to your word daily, that we allowed your spirit to speak through the preserved text, to touch our lives, to transform us into the image of your son, whom we follow. In Christ's name I pray, amen. All right, so again, you should have read the first seven chapters of the Gospel of John. As I told you last week, um, as we discussed the end of Luke, I warned you that John is a very different writer. He has a very different personality, a very different writing style, and if you weren't sure about that, the first 18 verses of the book should have shown. This, this guy writes differently. I told you last week that we're gonna actually do the first 18 verses of the book of John. That's gonna be the focused lesson. We're gonna do the prepared lesson first rather than the open mic session first because it starts the book. And I figured, let me, in case the questions that flowed were based on some perhaps confusion on what the heck did John mean when he's talking about the word and all this stuff. Um, so we're going to do that here in a few minutes and then at the end with the time we have left will be our traditional open mic session. So allow me to just reverse the order if you'd be so kind. I meant to say last week, and forgive me for not, a point that uh, a point of clarification that might have come in handy for some of you. The John, the namesake of this gospel, is not John the Baptist. And that's, an, that's a confusion many people find is because John the Baptist shows up in chapter 1, and, you know, which John are we talking about? So I meant to tell you last week, and I had notes to it, and I didn't read the notes. But the John, the namesake of this gospel, the believed writer of this gospel, is John, one of the 12 disciples, the brother of James, the sons of Zebedee, that's the John. And, you, and you'll figure that out as you go on and you learn that John the Baptist is dead and yet there's still text to John the Gospel. Clearly the two aren't related, but in the early goings, I meant to tell you that in case, again, there was some confusion as to which John is putting, I say, pen to paper or quill to parchment or whatever the heck they were using at the time to write this Gospel. This is, this is John the disciple, one of the top three. And you've seen it in the first three Gospels, where oftentimes when Jesus had a more private setting, it was John, James, and Simon Peter. So he was kind of within the, the more special three or, or the closer to Jesus than some of the other disciples who were obviously closer to Jesus than the crowd and then all those who followed. John, the writer of this Gospel, refers to himself in this Gospel, in the third person, often as, quote, the disciple whom Jesus loved. So you'll see that reference, that's him basically saying me, but not saying me. He didn't want to write this in first person. None of the Gospels are first person narratives where I did so and so, it's all third person. Uh, and anyhow, so the John of the Gospel is the disciple John, not the cousin of Jesus, Baptist John. All right, so again, normally we'd have an open mic session. I'm gonna reverse the order. I want us to look at and really sink our teeth into and dissect hopefully with some clarity, the beginnings of the Gospels, specifically the first 18 verses of the book of John. We're going to read them a, a verse or two at a time and kind of pause and chop them up instead of reading the whole thing and going back. Because again, the writing style is very different. John writes more poetically with, with, with imagery. You see it a lot in the book of Revelation, which was also penned by John. Tons of imagery, and, and that could very well be that that's what he observed. And Jesus used imagery to present these things to John, or it could be that Jesus presented something in John's own persona of imagery and whatever is how, you know, Revelation looks the way it does. But John's just a different writer than is Luke, than is Mark, than is Matthew, and that John's style is quite different. So let's go ahead, enough of that. Let's go ahead and look at the first chapter. Uh, we're going to go ahead and, like I said, do a verse or two at a time and pause and dissect it. So if you could kick up the first slide. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All right. Uh, so again, confounding. If you're just reading that like traditional reading, that doesn't make the least bit of sense. So let's, let's take a look at that. First off, this reference to the Word. What is the Word? Which John's referring to in, the, in these first two verses. Jesse. 
Jesus, yeah. And, and I said what kind of as a trick question, because when we think of word, we think of inanimate, we think of spoken whatever or written text. We don't think of a persona, but you see in verse two, it says he was. So the word that's referenced a few times, John makes clear if it wasn't clear in verse one that the, John, that the word is not what we would normally think of as word, but is a person. He, the word, was with God in the beginning. And the word in your translation, the one that, that I had Mark you up, uh, which is the, I'll call it the old fangled NIV from the 80s. I don't know what you're looking at on your phone or in your paper Bible. I suspect yours also has a capital W for the word word rather than lowercase. Do any of you have a lowercase w when the word is referenced here within the first few verses of John? If so, raise your hand. All right, so again, capital W suggests the name. Um, so again, th this opening passage is, is John introducing us to Jesus with a very different style. And you might ask the question, well, why, why would John call Jesus the word? Any thoughts on that one? There's no real right or wrong answer, just sort of having a, a brain picking session here. Any thoughts on why John would have used this label to identify Jesus? Great, so Warren said he, meaning Jesus, brought the word of salvation. Great, again, I'm, there's not a right answer. I'm not gonna say you're right or wrong. Let's just think through some thoughts. Great answer, Warren. Any other thoughts? Greg. Good. Okay, perfect. So, so Greg was referencing kind of the, the communicative mission of Jesus and that we saw in the past, uh, and the example Greg referenced was, was Moses, where God sort of spoke in an audible voice, but it wasn't coming from a person. Now Jesus is going to be the, the personification of God's spoken word, and he is going to be the instrument God uses to communicate to mankind, both his initial audience as he's traipsing around the sand, and then for those of us millennia later who are sitting here reading the book. Great answer. Uh, another answer I thought of, again, there, again, there's not a right, another answer I thought of is throughout the Bible, not so much the Gospels that we've read because Jesus has been in flesh, but the stuff that preceded the Gospel, there were countless references to the word of the Lord came to so-and-so and spoke so-and-so. And so the, the idea of the word of the Lord was replete in Scripture, and it was an encounter that many had. Prophets certainly heard the word of the Lord, and their task was to communicate this. I'm telling you this, prophet so-and-so, you go tell the people this, and they did. Or the word of the Lord came to somebody and said, go do this, and they had the opportunity to obey or disobey. So the word kind of has always existed. The word has always interacted with mankind. Prior to Jesus coming in the flesh, the word was a means of communication. Jesus is now the vehicle or the method by which that communication enters you know, in flesh. And so those are some, again, there's not a right answer. Um, those are some thoughts that some of the scholars and, uh, and academics had as to why John would have chosen this particular level. The ultimate answer to my question is because the Holy Spirit told him to. Because uh, hopefully all of us in this room and all of us hearing fr from online believe that all of this is Holy Spirit scripture inspired. Uh, and, it's, and that's one of my favorite verses. John 3.16 is great, but uh, I think it's 2 John 3.16 that says the, you know, the, the Holy Spirit. I'm going to read that. Give me a second to read that because that's, to me, that makes John 3.16 relevant and important. I'm drawing a blank on whether it's 2 John or 1 John. Give me a, bear with me if you would. All right, so I'm, I'm wrong in both regards. Darn it. Where is it? Somebody help me out here. I just now went on a rabbit trail, and I, um, maybe it's Peter. I could have sworn it was John. Um, All Scripture is God breathed, and is used for teaching, rebuking, training, and the way of righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Where is that verse? Help me, somebody. It's a 3:16 verse because I, I use that to juxtapose John 3:16. I could have sworn. Second Timothy. Thank you. I knew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Second Timothy 3:16. Let me read it now that I've butchered the thing. Here we go. Uh, yes, perfect. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Without the truth of 2 Timothy 3.16, John 3.16 means diddly. 
I mean, some guy wrote some crazy stuff on a piece of paper and is trying to propagate who knows what. So if we believe that, that all of this is God-breathed and is Holy Spirit-inspired, then the John 3.16 matters and it, and it changes our life and everything else. So the question, you know, why would the disciple John use this label to describe Jesus? Because the Holy Spirit inspired him to do that because he used John who has this imagery and this kind of different persona, different writing style. I'm going to use John to communicate this particular version of gospel this particular way and you're going to call Jesus the word. And it's going to confound some folks and it's going to enlighten other folks. And, and yeah, so that's... We're, we're, we've now left the rabbit trail and we're back in the study. So back to, uh, to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. So he calls Jesus the Word. And if we look at these two verses, we're still up on the screen. We learn a lot about Jesus in just these two verses. What are some things we learn about Jesus just from the verses that you see on your screen right now? Always been here. Always been here. So Dan said he's always been here. In the beginning was the Word. So there wasn't a time that predated the Word. There wasn't a time where Jesus wasn't. Whenever that beginning was, Jesus was there. All right, what else? What else do we learn about Jesus in this one? He is God, yes. Uh, that's the end of verse one. He was with God and he was God. He was with God in the beginning. So if we think about so. Correct, Diana. And so we have this idea of Jesus being with God and Jesus being God. What theological label do those words sort of trigger in your brain as you think about being with God yet being God? What does that communicate to us? Trinity, yeah, so a confounding notion of the Trinity, and man still, man in the gender neutral sense, still has a hard time fully wrapping his brain around what exactly is the Trinity? How exactly does it work? This, the first 18 verses touch on the Trinity a lot, and we're going to see that, but particularly in verse 1, so Jesus always was. He was not only with God always, but he was God always. What does that mean? Mark. Also, the two that Jesus was the second that Jesus was Oh, good. So, so Mark said this also dispels the misconception that Jesus was a, a plan B or, or an afterthought. Things didn't work out as plans. So let me introduce the idea of Jesus, and, and he's a, some kind of a later created being to, to fix what man messed up. No, you're right. Jesus has always been, and... and and has always been God. All right, uh, go ahead and hit the next slide if you would be so kind. So verse three, through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. We're gonna read four in a second, so leave the slide up, but let's just focus on three. So we just talked about the Trinity, and now this particular rendition from John suggests to us that the him, and the him is the word, and the word is Jesus, so that's the, that's the person that this pronoun is referring to. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that was made. To many of us, that seems counterintuitive, because many of us, when we think of the Trinity, we think sort of categorically. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And when we think categorically, we often assign not necessarily roles and, and hierarchy, although some of that comes into play, but we also assign like activities. Maybe I shouldn't project on you, me. I have always thought that. Uh, I always viewed, whether I was taught or came up with it myself, that God the Father was many things, including the Creator. And Jesus Christ the Son was many things, not the creator. He was the savior, he was, you know, all these other things, but God was a creative force and God did that stuff and Jesus did other things and the Holy Spirit. So John blurs, at least to, to folks who thought like I did, blurs this compartmentalization of the Trinity because he's telling us in verse three that Jesus, through Jesus all things were made and nothing was made without Jesus. So that communicates to us that in this idea of Trinity, that Jesus had a role in creation. It was not just God. Genesis you know, says God spoke, whatever, and we kind of think that, and we think God the Father, and we allocate that test to God the Father and, and a nice little box, and there's a separate box for Jesus, and we put other things in his box, but not that. So this, this narrative, to me at least, sort of expanded my idea of the Trinity and of who did what within the history of everything and within the creation of everything. And I find that helpful. I'm glad that John did that. The more I thought about that issue as this particular verse, and, and we see later on in verse 10, which will hit that, that this idea is communicated again, I was fine and comfortable with this idea of God the Father and certain things for him and God the Son and God the Holy. And 
by slowing down and looking at this particular verse and the, the one that f comes later on, why I found that helpful is I think perhaps the idea of overly segmenting and compartmentalizing things of the Trinity is, is error and is harmful to one's view of God and to one's interaction with God and the relationship one has with God. At least I'm, I'm challenged to think that now because the Holy Spirit told John, the disciple, a son of Zebedee, to write these words and kind of blow up the idea that God was a creator and, and no one else at the water. So we see in here that, again, John is communicating to his readers and to the, you know, the initial readers of his letter and then to those who followed that not only was Jesus at the very beginning, there was no time predating Jesus, not only was he with God and not only is he God, but as a part of being God, he was involved in creation. Important stuff. All right, so the slide is up. We're going to go ahead and keep verse 4. We'll do 4 and 5. In, so back to verse uh, John 1, verse 4. In him was life, and that light, life was the light of men. If you can roll to verse 5. That light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. All right, so we're going to look at 4 and 5. There's different slides on your screen. But uh, John now identifies Jesus as, can you go back to the verse 4 slide, please? Thank you, John. In him was life. So again, the him is Jesus. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. So let's just focus on that. So as we see John talking about in him, in Jesus was life, what do you think he's meaning by that phrase? Again, John's is not so straightforward. So we kind of have to pause and think, what, you know, what is John communicating by saying in Jesus was life? Thoughts on that one? Salvation, it was what one thought. Yes, Warren? Uh, I'm kind of backing up a little bit, but I'm curious what you think of this, because in John 7, let us, and in any time. Yeah. Great. 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 The creation of man, God speaks and he says, let us. So he's clearly referring to more than himself. He's re that's the earliest reference to the Trinity. Before that, it's God said so and so and it did, but you're absolutely right. So Genesis speaks to the issue. John speaks clearly to the issue. Uh, great point, Warren. Thank you. So as to this question, though, in him was life, you know, what does that mean? So Greg referenced salvation, maybe eternal life. Other thoughts? Again, not a right or wrong answer, just sort of wanting us to, to chew on John's stuff because his stuff has more to chew on than does Luke's or Matthew's. There's, they're more you know, fact-based and straightforward. John's kind of wrapped his stuff in a riddle, shrouded in a mystery, whatever that phrase is. It does not, I would say it does not just mean that Jesus was a living person. You could say it means that, in him was life, so, so Jesus became human, kind of the, the a poetic imagery reference to the incarnation of God in the form of Jesus, and in him was life, so he's a breathing, walking entity, not, not, a, not a visible spirit, but, but a human flesh. Uh, but I think, to Greg's point, it's, it's more than that. It's not just calling him a, a living guy. It's calling him a living guy who has more than just the breath of life, as mankind knows it, but has the gateway to eternal life, as, as the Gospel of John spells out very, very plainly. Um, so then in verse 5, go to the next slide, if you would, please, Tony. So in verse 5, we talk about this light and darkness. So the end of 4, it says, Jesus, in him is life, and that life is the light of, of man. And then it talks about this light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. So the, the juxtaposition John is making here is Jesus, as human flesh, has this eternal life about him, has this word of God mission about him. He is the source of light. He is... He is he is what will cast out the shadows um, of evil, cast out shadows of confusion, of men striving to know what's my next step, what happens when I breathe my last, all the things that kind of create this darkness and this gloom. Jesus, part of his mission to be the spoken word is to, is to shine light on these areas. But yet, as it shines light in the darkness, the darkness has not understood it. So this, this reference to the fact that mankind who has been comfortable in darkness finds light off-putting and confusing, and, and as you see later on, I, I don't know if you got the slide, um, Tony or, or Mark, for John 3, 19 through 20. If not, I'll read it. It was on the list. A um, little rabbit trail. So John mentions this again as he's dialoguing with Nicodemus. All right, no problem. Let me get to it. So 
this idea of darkness and light, and so the question is begged, if the darkness, meaning mankind, has not understood it, why? Part of why uh, John addresses when he's talking to Nicodemus. So you can stay where you are. I'm reading from John 3, verses 19 through 20. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. So John references that, you know, in the beginning, kind of calling back what Jesus himself said. Mankind, darkness, likes to stay there. Things that, things that succeed in darkness, you know, just in, in, in biology, in just basic biology, be it marine biology or otherwise, things that, that seem to grow in darkness generally don't like light. You shine light and it changes their environment, they go away. So mankind is, is sort of like that and that unfortunately due to our sin nature, we generally walk in darkness. And we sort of like that. And somebody shines a bright light in our face and we don't care for that too much. It shows too much. It shows the shadow of our, of our misdeeds and whatever else. So man doesn't like, uh, mankind that lives in darkness doesn't like light, doesn't understand light, chooses not to because they don't want to expose themselves. That's sort of kind of what John's referencing a bit here. All right, moving on, verses six through seven. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. So again, this was the reference. This is not John, the writer of John. That's why there was confusion that I meant to clarify last week. So this is referring to John the Baptist, who we learn more about later on, but this fellow John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all men might believe. So that we're just touching on the ministry of John the Baptist was the harbinger of Jesus. His task was to come and to announce and to proclaim, you know, the coming Messiah is here. We're no longer praying to somebody that's going to show up at some point. He's here living and breathing in our, in our midst, so to speak, and, and I'm making way the, the path of the Lord. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. So, again, just a little side note about John's ministry. Now we're getting back into some of the meat here. Um, beginning in verse 10, or resuming in verse 10. Sorry if I'm getting ahead of you, Tony. Uh, yeah, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. So again, this reference to Jesus being the creator, a creator within the Trinity, not relegated to some other world, or to some other role. The world that he helped create didn't recognize him. You can, I, I won't have us pause and contemplate that, but you can certainly pause and contemplate, well, why in the world? <laughs> Wouldn't you, create, wouldn't you recognize your own creator? Moving on. Uh, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. <clears throat> All right, let's pause there. So he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. So his own, again, is mankind. He, he created mankind, and he, and he came. The, this was the commission time. As Mark said up from the balcony, Jesus was not an afterthought, a plan B, a, a, a decision tree. If this goes well, great. Otherwise, we're going to go this path, and it's going to involve Jesus. Jesus was always in the plan. Um, and yet, when he shows up to his own, they, they didn't receive him. Mankind didn't receive him. And, and this is used in... This is spoken in past tense because John is writing, you know, from his time, but it could be present tense. He comes to that which is his own, and his own do not receive him. That's the same deal's happening right now. You know, we might have different, we might have different mindsets, and I'm, I'm not saying we, this group, hopefully this group has received him, does receive him, but mankind in general in the year 2021 does not receive him, just like mankind in 8030 or whatever it was in his, you know, public ministry began didn't receive him. Same kind of issues. Um, but, moving on, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of a natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. So even though mankind generally has rejected Jesus, to those who have not, to those who have received him, he gives the right, and I want to focus on that word. He gave the right to become children of God. So in my world of law, the word right has a certain legal connotation that's distinct from privilege or other similar issues. The word right is, is immutable. Uh, the, our declaration, you know, or, or is it the Constitution? 
I should know this as a lawyer. Um, uh, these inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I think that's the declaration. And Thomas Jefferson saying, the king has infringed on our right. The king of England's infringed on our inalienable rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. So a right is something that once one has it, it's, it's, it's in their control. Nobody can block them. Nobody can legally, lawfully block them from exercising their right, whatever that right might be, as opposed to a privilege which is at the behest of whomever is the right holder. Your driver's license doesn't give you a right to drive on the road. The, Florida, the state of Florida has said, I'm allowed so-and-so to drive as long as you've demonstrated competence and you've passed the written, the written test and you've passed the driven, driving test and if you've stopped doing that, um, I'm yanking your license. So it's, that's not a right we have. That's a privilege. That would be a legal privilege. Somebody else has the authority to say yay or nay to our exercise of whatever, whatever that activity might be. A right is different. So in this passage, I think it, as a lawyer, I think it interesting that the word used is right, which in a sense says once we have come into God's fold, we now have right. We now have something that can't be taken from us. It speaks to the idea of eternal security. It speaks to the idea that, you know, the one saved, always saved is a more plain speak uh, phrasing that you may have heard for this idea of eternal security. It, this also addresses some of the confusion for the passages that speak to predestination and folks wonder does that mean certain folks are predestined to be uh, spend eternity in hell versus heaven and to me that's a difficult concept and I, I in all candor I wish the predestination the hen shut up because it would I think be a lot less confusing but where I land on that is that predestined speaks to this right deal once you've become saved you're predestined once you become saved to have these rights and these and these are rights as though you are the son of God children of God. And so John kind of references that idea as he talks about, even though the majority of folks have rejected him, didn't recognize him, those who do, he has, he's given them the right to become children of God. And that status it gives lots of rights. Being a child of God versus being you know, outside of the family of God is an entirely different scenario for the person in that situation. Uh, just, by the way, I'm, I'm kind of trucking through this. Raise hands or ask questions if you have any. I don't mean to neglect the chance for questions, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to roll until I'm asked to stop. Uh, verse 14. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. All right, so that verse speaks to, I think, a critical issue that we have heard phrased like, Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. Hopefully you've heard that phrase. Hopefully you've embraced that truth. This verse speaks that. The word became flesh, so it speaks to the idea of humanity. The word that we've identified previously is Jesus, so Jesus became flesh. Again, he's not a visible spirit nature. He's, a, he's, in person, you know, he's personified. Incarnate is another word you've, you've heard. So Jesus became flesh. He became flesh and blown. You cut his skin and he's going to bleed. I mean, at the end when he resurrected, the, the, the disciples were excited because he actually ate fish in their midst. And he did that to demonstrate, I'm, I'm bodily resurrected. This is not a visible spirit now. I'm, I'm still a fella. I'm a, I'm a raised fella, and I'm going to eat fish because I'm hungry like the rest of y'all. So the word became flesh, speaks to his humanity, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. So the glory part is where we transition from the idea of 100% man to 100% God. Mankind, we don't have glory, I'm sorry to tell you. We might want it, we might strive to, you know, to buff ourselves up in a way to kind of look glorified, but glory is something that speaks to divinity, it speaks to God. So in this verse, when he's talking about the word becoming flesh, identifying the humanity of Jesus, and yet we've still seen his glory, speaks to the divinity of Jesus. And that in the person of Jesus, both things coexisted. And kind of knowing that and, and standing on that is gonna, should help you both as you read through the gospel and as you consider you know, who is Jesus in your life. Those are critical attributes, and both of them are necessary. And both of them are by design. That was plan A all along, to Mark's point. Jesus always was, and he was always going to become flesh, and for a period of his existence, be 100% man and 100% God, and do things to mankind and for mankind that could not have been accomplished otherwise. So knowing that and seeing you know, John referencing that in this passage is, is, to me, that's sort of what that issue spoke to, is his complete divinity while his complete humanity. Because if he's only part, so let's think to the eye. What if he only was partially human, if he was dominantly divine, but he had some 
some flavorings of humanity, or the, or the opposite, fully human and, and was more inclined toward God than the average Joe, but wasn't really divine. He wouldn't, if, he was if he was totally divine and not fully human, then he wouldn't have experienced the sin temptations that we do, that, that the Bible says he did. He, he was tempted, though, without sin, and he didn't succumb to the temptations, so he overcame them. And part of his ministry, part of his humanity ministry is to, is to come and live the life we've lived so that he can speak to us and he can have authority for our situation because he's been there. Any, any person you've ever sought counsel from, whether it's professional or otherwise, oftentimes the value of their counsel is they've been where you are. They've dealt with this issue, whatever it is, academic, uh, marital, whatever. Um, you, know, you don't go to somebody who's never done that and say, hey, what do you think of this issue? You're not going to seek counsel from that person. You're going to go to somebody who speaks to the issue because they've been there. They've conquered it. They've overcome it. Or they fall on their face and they can teach you lessons from their mistakes. So part of Jesus' humanity is that he's been where we are. He's been where we are right now, and he can communicate to us and can minister to us uniquely because of his 100% humanity. But by the same token, being 100% divine and showing us how, despite being human, we can overcome our flesh nature and our whatever else. So anyhow, this is a key point, uh, and John 1.14 communicates that key point. Moving, moving to, to finish this passage, John 15 and 16. John testifies concerning him. So this is now, again, not John the writer. This is John the Baptist. That's why there's this confusion. John the Baptist testifies concerning him. He cries out saying, this is he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. We know that Jesus was physically born after John the Baptist. So John is referencing that his cousin by, by mom predated him, even though he didn't. So again, a, a confusion for, for maybe his audience, but John was speaking truth, knowing that Jesus was the word, was in the beginning, was with God, created stuff, all that. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I'm just gonna pause there for a second. So verse 17 speaks to and contrasts the law with grace and truth. And many, myself included at times, have, have wrongly taken the view that the New Testament and the New Covenant was like a replacement of the first one. And this verse speaks not to replacement, not to plan B, but speaks to supplementation, speaks to completion. There's, there's a reason why we still have an Old Testament in our Bible. If the New Covenant scrapped all that, then your, new, then your Bible would be a lot thinner. You know, would have however many books there are. My son can tell me how many books there are in the New Testament versus the whole deal, 20 some odd versus the high 30s. Um, the New Testament and Jesus' ministry completes the law. It, it supplements the law. It, it enables us to understand the law and how we can interact with the law and, and not be judged by it only, but how we can overcome through him. And so this verse speaks to the, the grace and the truth that Jesus delivers that mankind really needs because of its law alone, we're doomed. Verse 18, so no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only who is at the Father's side, has made him known. So anyhow, there was a lot, and I, and I honestly, I'd never taught this passage, never really sat and, and thought long and hard about it. This was a passage that to me was more poetic, and I kind of like to fly through that and get to the fact stuff. So I have, through my life, not paused and thought of this, but as I, as I sat here for this one in an effort to maybe make clear what was not to the class and to myself, I realized, holy cow, there's just a ton of great bedrock theological truths in these first 18 verses that are written in a way that could easily be missed or not understood or, or, or fearful and you kind of blow through them as I have done for the majority of my life. So John just chalks a lot of this up. The, the other fellows, gospels, you know, Mark doesn't talk about the birth, uh, nor does John, but Matthew and Luke talk about the birth and the backstory, and they really kind of lay out the story of Jesus and John begins his much differently. He's talking huge, broad, bedrock, fundamental truths that in his mind lay the, lay the groundwork for the rest of what he's going to write about and why you should care about reading the rest of what he's going to write about. Powerful stuff. Any thoughts or questions on those first 18 verses before we do our open mic session? All right. So normally what we do is we start with an open mic session where I invite the folks who were here and the folks who were online, if you have any thoughts or questions from the readings this week, the first seven chapters of the Gospel of John, if you want to raise your hand and share a question or share an insight or an encouragement or whatever, 
from your readings. We're gonna go ahead and take another 10 minutes-ish or so and allow for that time. So please, anybody, if you have a thought, now's your time. I was afraid that teaching a lesson up front might sort of put the, uh, the clamps on people wanting to talk at the end, but I, yes. Great, Diana, go ahead, thank you. Not sure I can add clarity to that one. Let me go ahead. So Diana's asking us to go to John chapter 3, the dialogue that Jesus has with Nicodemus. Specifically, her question was in verse 8. Before we go there, let's just set the stage. So Nicodemus shows up. He's one of the Pharisees. Uh, he shows up under the cover of darkness and nighttime. He, as you'll learn in this dialogue, he, if he's not a believer, wholesale believer, he's at least bold enough to say, you know what, I think, y'all are, I think you are of God and I want to learn more. And my peers don't and they hate you and so I, I can't just like walk in the middle of daytime and start talking to you because I'm going to get in trouble. So let me, let me shut up at night here, you know, let me in, I have some questions for you. Uh, and so they have this dialogue out of which obviously you guys know John 3, 16 comes. It comes because Nicodemus is bold enough to come to Jesus and say, I think there's something to you. Tell me more. Um... But Diana, Diana doesn't want us to look at that familiar passage. She wants us to look at a confounding verse. Thanks, Diana. Verse uh, 8 of chapter 3. I'll read it out loud. Let me read. Actually, let me, if you'll allow me, let me go ahead and read verses 4 through 8 to get the question and kind of Jesus' response. So Jesus, um, well, I guess I've got to go back earlier. All right, I'm going to read the whole first eight verses. I think that might help us. So I'm going to read John 3, verses 1 through 8. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. So I I find that interesting. He didn't say, I know. He says, we know. know. Is he being inaccurate or is he kind of saying, you know, a lot of my peers know this and yet they still hate you and want you done with. Anyhow. We know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Seems an odd response to this statement. God didn't ask any questions about, you know, how, how come... So Jesus is perceiving that even though his, the, the Pharisees and the ruling council are observing this. Some are kind of seeing with clarity and some aren't, and he's, I think, referencing why. So then Nicodemus asks this question, well, how can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asks. Surely he cannot enter the second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. So pause right there. So there's, you know, some would say that verse 5 speaks to a mandate of water baptism. You can't, you can't come to Jesus unless you're born of water and of the Spirit. And then verse 6 talks about flesh and spirit and seems to be kind of going off cue. Most folks who reject the idea of a mandatory water baptism would say that this reference to water and physical birth are one and the same like a woman's water breaking and a child coming and being born, the kind of the human humanity of birth as well as the spirituality of birth, the flesh giving birth to flesh, spirit to spirit. All right, verse 7. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. Here's Diana's verse. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but, do not, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. So Diana has a question, and Nicodemus does as well, well, how can this be? So not a, you know, not a crystal clear response. Diana's challenging me to come up with some clarity, and I'm trying to do it on the fly here, Diana, um, with a little, with great difficulty, I must say. So the reference to the, to the wind, and we've, we've heard, you, you may have heard, the idea of the wind. It's something that's not visible. You see its effects, but you don't see it. 
You know, there's nothing about wind that, that catches your eye, but you see a tree swing, or you see leaves not falling straight, but going to the side. You see people's hair. So you can see the effects of wind. No wind is present, even though you can't see wind. So many times people use that reference in this verse to the idea of the spirit being active in a setting or in a person. You can't necessarily see the spirit, but you can see the effects of the spirit, be it a congregation, an individual, a an event of some sort. Um, so the, the referencing there is kind of alluding to the, the spirit natures, how one knows and detects the spirit involvement, much like how one knows of a wind's involvement. You see the effect, you see the influence the wind has on something, so too you see the influence a spirit has on something, in this case, the spirit, the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure that clarifies your question, Diana, but that's sort of some of what's being discussed here. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it's coming and going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. So really, that's, I think, the confusion part of the verse that you're asking me about, and I don't know that I have a great answer. Anybody have any thoughts to the last sentence in verse John 3, 8? So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Other than kind of the things I just sort of discussed, that someone born of the Spirit is going to demonstrate the effects of the Spirit like a tree is going to demonstrate the effects of the wind. I, mean, I think that's sort of the answer, but it's not a real comfortable answer. I don't know that it adds the clarity that you'd like or that I'd like. Um, any, any other thoughts on that question? Mark. Yeah, I think, you know, human nature is to always try to understand events, right? Hmm. Uh, and like with wind, we don't know where it comes from. We don't know where God comes from either, right? Wind always floods, but we don't know where it comes from. Our human brain is always like, well, where did it come from? You know, uh, so I don't know if that's what this is trying to get across, that just like the wind, you know, those who hear it, we believe in God, but we don't know where it came from. Hmm. Great thoughts. So to, to recap for those who, uh, who maybe couldn't hear Mark or the, or the online folks, so Mark was saying that, you know, mankind generally, part of our desire to, to be in control of our destiny is to, to know as much as we can and to understand it so that we can follow a clear path and knowing kind of what comes from that path. And things of the spirit oftentimes are beyond our, our full knowledge, our full ability to comprehend. Uh, and so Mark was kind of alluding to the idea that uh, you know, as the comparison to the wind and the spirit, we don't, we don't and can't fully understand the spirit nature of things. We can't fully understand the spirit nature of God. We have to at some point trust that, it, that God is spirit and that God through spirit can have great impact and influence on people just like wind can have great impact and influence on nature. But as it relates to a person born of the spirit, he or she can be influenced by the spirit and at the same time not know exactly where that came from or where it's going or how you can dissect it to know with precision what does it mean and how and this and the other. I think trying to restate a bit of what Mark said. I think you said it better than me, but yeah, it could be some of that. It could be, you know, Nicodemus is asking questions. Diane is asking questions. I'm asking questions. And, and I think God is good with that. Next week we'll talk about uh, a verse that really encourages question asking, there's a great spiritual truth that comes from questions. And we get John 3, 16 because Nicodemus shows up and asks questions. So questions are great. I don't think there's anything about a, a faith walk that says thou shalt not ask questions. But at some point, faith is a position we take when we don't have an answer. At some point, the questions just need to relent, you need to yield to, you know, I don't know. <laughs> and I don't even know how many questions I'm not even contemplating asking, let alone the answers to my last question. At some point, I'm going to say, even though I don't know, don't fully understand, can't fully understand, I'm going to just accept on faith that this is true, that you really are, that you're going to do the things that the Word says you're going to do, that the Word is actually Holy Spirit inspired, not just a bunch of whack jobs writing crazy stuff and all the various other things we have to do at some point just accept by faith. Questions are helpful. Questions give us, questions prime the pump so God can speak and move and do great things, but we're never going to get full answers to our questions, and at some point, faith is going to require that we just stop asking. So not to say this is a bad question. It was a great question. It's good worth having this discussion, but to Mark's point, maybe some of this is to say, you know, the Spirit does things that are sort of beyond, even beyond the one who is being influenced by the Spirit to really understand fully how that's happening or why. Sir? Yeah, it does. Hebrews 11:6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Exactly. Great point. 
And that's what he wants from us. He wants us to please him. So he wants us to take faith positions and we dig as much as we can. But at some point, we've got to tell God, you know what, I'm going to have faith. Good stuff. Um, so I think I'm out of time for our mic session. Let me go ahead. Thank you all. Let me go ahead and close us in prayer and we will be dismissed. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for being the word and always being and being involved in creation and not just as one part of who you are, but all of you was involved in creating each of us and your desire to shine light and bring life to the darkness of mankind, including ourselves. Thank you for being flesh and being 100% human to have the experience that gives you the authority to speak to our lives, uh, yet being 100% divine um, and knowing all things and being entirely trustworthy, Lord. We thank you for the, the countless truths that you have shared just in the first 18 verses of John, let alone all the chapters we've read to date within these Gospels, um, and that despite that, there comes a time and a place in each of our lives where we have to stake a position on faith, not knowing fully the answers or the information we might desire. You are beyond that uh, by design, and we have to, by design, realize at some point our decisions need to be in trust and not in comprehension. So I just pray as we continue to read through uh, what will be the next seven chapters of John that we can allow you to speak to us through those words, through your Holy Spirit, um, that it can be relevant in the year 2021 as it was to the original audience back in AD 0 whatever, um, that we would allow ourselves to be influenced by your Spirit, um, that we can demonstrate the influence of the Spirit in our lives, much like trees demonstrate the influence of wind, that others might see the Spirit in how we live, how we interact, how we think and speak, that we might be more like your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you.